I was listening to Anne and Peter half a year ago at a conference, and as I said at the opening of this film festival, that I kind of getting a little bit tired when I'm at these different conferences, it's so many words, but when I listened to you, Anne and Peter, it was a freshness and I kind of woke up in my chair. So I'm so happy that you are here. Please come up on the stage. Thank you. It's not often I go to an event where we have the only PowerPoint presentation in the entire event. Maybe we can just introduce ourselves while it's coming up. Um, as Hannah said, I'm uh, Anne Cook and this is Peter Kinderman. We're uh, from the British Psychological Society and we're going to talk to you about a, a project of, from the British Psychological Society, um, which is this, this book that we have produced here. So we're going to talk to you about, maybe this is a rather grandiose title, uh, we see this as an attempt to change society's whole approach to psychosis. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you have newspapers like this uh, here, but this is the most popular British newspaper. We all know that the, the, the public image of mental illness is full of this kind of stereotype. I won't read it out, you can read it yourself, but I imagine you can recognize something like that. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is a campaign that we have to ca counteract this, this stereotype in the, in the UK, but I think it sums up the stereotype quite well. There's them and there's us. We are well, happy and safe. They are mentally ill and dangerous. So the, the campaign is called Only Us. Um, there's no them and us. Okay, so the, the, uh, the problem is, this is the problem that we were trying to solve with our book, um, that the, public inf the information that is out there that is available about mental illness, about schizophrenia, um, reinforces this stereotype. It certainly has a very narrow view of uh, what mental illness is. So these are all taken from uh, public information sites. As you can see, some of them are from drug companies, not all of them. So basically, the information that is out there available, uh, if you are, you know, if you hear voices like the people we just saw in that film, this is what it's going to tell you. It, you have a brain disease. Um, maybe I should explain at this point why we use the term schizophrenia and psychosis in our title, because as we've been hearing throughout the weekend, these are terms that a lot of people don't find helpful. But we wanted people to be able to Google it, because obviously if somebody hears voices or they're diagnosed with schizophrenia, and they, they Google schizophrenia, they find all this stuff. They don't find something helpful. So, well, it, helpful in our view. So that's, that's why we use the titles. We had a lot of discussions about whether to use inverted commas. Okay, so this, some, this idea of mental illness, it does have some advantages. Um, for example, these, these pictures represent, you know, you can get help in the form of psychotherapy, medication some people find helpful. Um, you can get time off sick, benefits if you need it. So yes, there's three things I think that the, uh, the idea of illness currently, the way our society is currently set up, the idea of illness gives us uh, access to these things that we really need. The three things, validation, you know, I'm okay, income, I can survive, I have enough money to live, and support, I have people around me who care about me and can support me. And I think when we're thinking as we are this weekend about alternatives, we need to think about how um, we can fulfill each of these things. Because at the moment, the illness model does that. If you are ill, you can have these things if you're considered ill. Um, but obviously, it has disadvantages as well, and I'm going to talk about those now. This is somebody uh, in the UK who's become quite famous because he made a film, actually, um, called Stranger on the Bridge. Maybe we could have that next year, if there's another one. Um, but he, he was... Um, the story is that he... He tried to kill himself jumping off a bridge, and the reason that he was so despondent was he'd been just been recently given a diagnosis of schizophrenia, and he said this, I felt like I'd been given a life sentence. All I knew was what I read in the papers, that people with schizophrenia are violent and incapable of recovery. So it's not only the public that, that get these messages, it's ob obviously those of us who are personally affected as well. What story do you have out there about what's likely to happen to you? Well, this is the story. Yes, this is a, uh, an unashamed plug for my blog, uh, or our blog, the, the department where I work, the university. Um, and this is written by somebody with personal experience of diagnosis. 
And she's writing this at the time, a couple of years ago, when DSM-5 came out. And you remember there was a big debate about the whole idea of psychiatric diagnosis. And for the first time, uh, bodies like the British Psychological Society were publicly questioning the idea of um, categorising our experiences in this way. So she writes this about her having received a diagnosis and now the idea that it might not be the only way to see the world. Our lives, historical and present, are forever affected by it. We have felt different. We have felt defective and unacceptable. We felt that our genes were inadequate and shouldn't be reproduced. We felt that our diagnoses had to be hidden because others might think us dangerous or unpredictable. At times, we felt so other that we had to hide our experiences even from one another. We lived with secrets and silence that reached into every corner of our lives. Just going on to some of the disadvantages of, of this way of thinking, uh, we've seen a lot of, about this in the films uh, this weekend. The, there is a real problem that, that the idea that we know you have a diagnosis, we know what's going on, you have an illness, gives us misplaced certainty. So there's this message from services, we know what's wrong, we know what you need. And as we've seen in some of the films, that's not always what people feel they need themselves. Nevertheless, they often have no choice. Yeah, also misplaced attention. So uh, our, we, we would argue that seeing things in this way distracts our attention from the, the actual things in people's lives that might contribute to their problems. They're often quite ignored. Uh, for example, as, as those people were just saying in the film we just saw, so um, these pictures represent racism, um, child abuse and poverty. Um, yes, yeah, so argu arguably all our attempts to help people, if we don't pay attention to these things in our lives, in our societies that contribute to these problems, it's a bit like trying to mop the floor, but with the water still running. Okay, so we're now we're coming to the book itself, and Peter, I've just told you a little bit about why we wrote it, and Peter's going to tell you a little bit about what's in it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So one of the things I just want to say in preface is uh, Laura yesterday uh, rather wonderfully talked about uh, being a white Harvard-educated American and some of the class privilege that that brings. And I guess attempting to be both arrogant and humble in equal measure, I think part of what Anne and I are doing is coming towards uh, people who've uh, experienced psychiatric care and saying that there are things that people in positions of power and influence and authority within civic society can do. So part of me putting on the uniform of a suit and tie and wearing the badge of the British Psychological Society says, uh, we too come to this party with the things that we come to the party with. We don't come with only with our personal stories. We also come with the academic authority. So it, what's important in this book is the way in which um, the, uh, the authors of the book from personal experience and from academic authority and from professional authority come to validate some of the messages that you've heard over this uh, uh, weekend. The most important message that we say is actually, uh, again, a slightly one down, slightly humble message, which is, uh, I suppose, we insist upon the fact that professionals should not insist that people accept any one particular framework of understanding. So, for instance, should not uh, insist that people accept a numerous role I guess that also means that we shouldn't reject and allow them to uh, refuse to allow them to, to adopt that role as well. So, uh, uh, the current chair of the Clinical Psychologists Professional Body in the UK described this as the end of compulsory mental illness thinking. There are a range of options out there, and you can choose. It's also worth pointing out that, that this is a plug for my organisation, uh, the British Psychological Society, where I certainly think that we are doing. <laughs> in the rather nasty phrase that uh, English people are using these days is thought leadership. So we've produced uh, a range of publications. We're talking about bipolar disorder, again, with the inverted commas. People will search for information about bipolar disorder. Uh, but the, the tagline underneath is why some people experiencing extreme mood states. And uh, understanding depression, that's changed slightly. But uh, um, I, I think the phrase that we're using there is profound low mood and hopelessness. And again, slightly changing the dynamic 
uh, bringing in a, uh, a professional perspective. But again, a, uh, a strand of publications pointing in the same direction. We should uh, give a name check to the people involved in it, and certainly for Anna and myself, what's important is the mix of professionals uh, uh, coming together. So you'll see Jackie Dillon uh, on that list, uh, and also Eleanor Longdon, uh, two people who themselves have talked about their, their own experience of, of hearing voices. Um, other people on that list have also experienced uh, significant mental health problems. And there's a spattering of people with the name Professor in front of their, their, their name. There we go. Lots of us are professors. And so it's a, it's a community. Um, we should say thank you to Anita, who did the pictures. I like the bird talking to, to the woman. I'm utterly convinced that that's an, an artistic representation of a hallucinatory voice speaking to the woman. Anita uh, is absolutely convinced that, that that's entirely in my own head, and she didn't intend that. So what are we saying? First of all, we're saying it's a contested area. Uh, for, for those of us who decide not to accept the message that is given to us, there is, there is a community of support for that uh, view. Um, the idea of lacking insight is something we need to address. Uh, and certainly for me, as a professor of clinical psychology and head of department, I, I vote with uh, Jackie. I, I don't think the term schizophrenia means anything more than the term unicorn. Uh, we can describe a unicorn, but it's meaningless. And we can describe schizophrenia, but it's meaningless. And also, because we are who we are, there's a psychosocial perspective. So this is the meat of it. What we say as clearly as we can, uh, hearing voices and feeling paranoid are common experiences, which can often be a reaction to trauma, abuse, and deprivation. Common and often are important words. Calling them symptoms of a mountain illness is only one way of thinking about them, with advantages and disadvantages. As professionals, academics, and also people who've experienced mental health issues, there is no clear dividing line between psychosis and other thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. And we thought very carefully about this phrase, but we're stating with as much conviction as we can that psychosis can be understood in the same way as other psychological problems, such as anxiety and shyness. And that doesn't mean we know everything about anxiety and shyness. It doesn't mean to say we have those problems nailed down and, and cured, but it means we can understand feeling paranoid or hearing voices to the extent that we can understand any other psychological or emotional state in human beings. We have to address the issue of the extreme distress and life-changing experiences that some people have, but also the fact that many people, like Jackie and like Eleanor Longdon, uh, uh, like Peter Beresford, experience huge distress, experience very clear and distressing experiences, but also uh, rebuild their lives after those experiences. And we try to be clear that for many people, the experiences of psychosis are short-lived. And for many people who continue to experience psychosis, uh, those experiences can be ones that they can live with. But we acknowledge that for other people, psychotic experiences can last all their lives, can change their lives. And because of the extreme distress and some of the unfortunate conclusions that people come to, uh, sometimes psychotic experiences can be life-threatening. And so, despite the fact that we're putting forward a message of hope, it is also important that politicians invest heavily in mental health services. And here again, the contested nature of what it means to experience these phenomena. And some people find it useful to think of themselves as having an illness. Uh, some people think of themselves as being ill on occasions. And some people think of themselves as having an illness that lasts throughout their lifetime, and other people reject that illness. So other people prefer to think of problems as being an aspect of their personality. Uh, so this is part of who I am, is a person who hears voices. A part of what I am as a human being is a person who experiences internal conflict as heard voices from other people. Uh, and as Jackie was hinting, for some people, this is a part of their personality that causes them distress, but they wouldn't be the same person without them. And so our conclusion is, and again, I need to emphasize that it, this is coming with the support and authority of professionals and academics who work in the area. People should not insist that individuals accept any one particular framework of understanding, and we should not insist that people uh, accept that their experiences are symptoms of an illness. We are slowly moving away from the idea of lack of insight being a problem. But I think we need to, to drive that message forward. Um, if, if somebody 
rejects the label of schizophrenia, then I vote, as a professor of psychology, I vote with them. I think they're making an accurate, factual statement about the nature of the world. We are unapologetically psychologists. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job as a day job if I didn't think that sitting down and talking to people in a professional manner about their experience wasn't actively helpful. I think that psychological therapies, properly conducted, uh, well-developed, professionally organized psychological therapies, are helpful for many people. And most people who experience psychosis cannot get those therapies. But more importantly, I think it's important that we acknowledge the importance, whether in formal psychological therapy or not, that people sit down and talk to people about their experiences, their way of looking at the world, the way that they look at themselves, and how people make sense of the things that have happened to them. And all too often, following the medicalized disease model of schizophrenia, Surprisingly few people find that professionals will sit down with them and talk to them about how they make sense either of their world or of the particular experiences that people are trying to treat. So people need to talk. People need to talk to each other. We try to sum up our view on medication, uh, which we go into detail, of course, in the book very clearly. It's clear and apparent that antipsychotic medication helps some people, for instance, to make the experiences less frequent, less intense, sometimes less stressful. Uh, many people find that antipsychotic medication acts as a buffer against stressful experiences to the extent often that many uh, ordinary experiences in one's life become quite flat and quite dull because it seems to buffer that experience of stress. But it's important to reflect the work done by very many psychiatrists about the idea that the drugs that people take, even when they are helpful, uh, probably do not target a specific underlying biological abnormality. They're helpful and useful, and some people find that it is difficult to live without them. But that's rather different from saying that the drugs are treating the underlying illness. And again, we need to be both uh, positive about the issues at hand, but also clear about the science behind it. And to suggest that people need to take antipsychotic medication because it treats the known underlying illness, I think is a misnomer. misnomer. People might benefit from taking antipsychotic medication, but when we accept that point of view, it changes the way that we understand these issues. We need to accept, again, as, as Laura, I think, did yesterday, that these issues don't come in a social vacuum. Psychosis is related to experiences of abuse, to deprivation, to victimization, and racism. That doesn't mean to say that those problems are there for everybody, but it does mean that, at least on a statistical basis, very many people who experience psychosis have experienced a great deal of abuse in their lives of various kinds. It's also clear that people from black and minority ethnic uh, backgrounds are more likely than others to be identified as uh, experiencing psychosis or suffering from illnesses such as schizophrenia. But they're also more likely to be treated in harsh ways and less likely to be offered psychological uh, therapies. And part of our agenda has to be to look at those social biases within services and in wider society. And so, and this is a difficult thing for professionals, I think it's a difficult thing for individuals, um, it's a difficult thing when we are speaking to politicians, if we are genuinely going to address uh, issues of improving mental health uh, services, preventing mental health problems emerging in the population, and changing the way that the population understands issues to do with mental health issues. We need to tackle issues of abuse, deprivation, and inequality. And of course, many politicians would much prefer it if the issues that we've been talking about this weekend were matters that could be left in the hands of doctors rather than requiring attention on the level of society. And it's difficult when we speak truth to power to say that part of what is needed is a societal response rather than sending people to the hospital to be treated. Um, this is just a slide about some of the response. The, the, the one that uh, I think, uh, well, there's two, three to bring out, I suppose. First is, Anne was on um, uh, the radio, BBC News. The BBC, I think, has been quite responsible in its coverage of these issues. It's taken the fact that there's more than one point of view, but covered this point of view very respectfully. Um, uh, is it Tanya Lerman wrote in the New York Times, uh, uh, she was extremely pleased 
uh, with our report and uh, found it uh, a breath of fresh air for her and changed her conception. But down here is probably our favourite. So just peeking out with his little bushy eyebrows. Sorry, that's very insulting to him. Just peeking out with his very little bushy eyebrows above the bottom of the screen is a, a guy called Jeffrey Lieberman. And uh, Jeffrey Lieberman was a former president of the uh, uh, American Psychiatric Association. And he was very upset, not quite by our report, which I don't think he bothered to read, um, but by uh, Tanya Lerman's article. And in it, he decided that he would do us the honour of summarising better than we could ourselves why we wrote the report. And he said that if people were stupid enough to read our report and pay attention to it, then they might question the diagnosis that they've been given and challenge the prescription of drugs that they've been offered. <laughs> it's also worth pointing out that he was so angry about it that he decided he should put on his white coat just to prove that he's a proper doctor. Uh, <laughs> Um, and this is a quote that, that Anne in particular loves because it comes back to the conjunction of people who do have power within the system and we've heard from psychiatrists and psychologists over the past couple of days but this is part of that story um, working with people who've experienced services so Jay Watts who herself has used services uh, talks about the facts and the crunching of evidence but what she says she loves most is that there's the space for the voices of people who are suffering and those who have thrived uh, outside the psychiatric systems. And so go to www.understandingpsychosis.net and download yourself a free PDF. Um, translate it into Swedish, and uh, I'm sure that the Swedish Psychological Society will uh, make it available to, to people uh, in Swedish. And that's our plea to you today. Thank you. Thank you.